Roy's house is not normal. A giveaway might be the goshawks having lunch on the breakfast bar or the large ball of twine sitting next to the kitchen sink. Tied to the other end is a trap door. Roy needs to nab some of his father's doves for the various activities he has planned for us this afternoon. The reason that we're trying to catch these pigeons is because uh, we've got obviously in the off season for hunting at the moment and so the dogs will be a little bit rusty so what we're going to do is going to go out take some pigeons out um, because we haven't got anywhere to work the pheasants or partridge plus this time of year um, we don't really want to be pushing pheasants around or partridge around because they'll probably be nesting so what we'll do we'll take the pigeons out dizzy them up put them in the fields and then um, just brush the dogs up a little bit to uh, get them pointing on the pigeons so hopefully that's what will happen just to, got to take up the slack Oof. All right, now we've got some pigeons. Now we've got to try and get them out of the trap without losing them, which is easier said than done. So I shall use my large bulk to block the doorway up. And then hopefully they can't get out around me. And the, I mean, the good thing about doing it this way is uh, obviously we can take them down the road not far away, so they're in their territory. Um, and they fly off and they're straight back here within five minutes to carry on feeding again. So, uh, yeah, they, uh, they do us a favour and uh, they get fed in return. With the doves bagged, it's time for a makeover. A quick rustle in the cupboard and we soon have the equipment needed to create colour-coded <coughs> pigeons. Now, ingredients that we've got for the pigeons today are food colourants. So, we're just going to colour a few of them up. So, really, just so as we know, yeah, don't want almond flavouring. Um, just so as we know which ones that we've used um, and just make sure that they're coming back really. So uh, obviously if we go quite a distance away when we're uh, doing the dogs then uh, some of them might not come back but we just want to make sure that we're not taking them too far. It's obviously quite good with white pigeons or white doves because it shows up very well. So we'll colour them, we'll do a few of different colours so as we can tell which ones have come back, etc. Right. And obviously this will just wash off in a few days time so it doesn't cause them any harm. Foxing is also on the agenda today so Roy cleans the rifle. It's an important routine to get into. After speaking with a a very good uh, rifle shot. Um, he always he, he told me that I should always shoot my rifles from clean. So when I start with a rifle um, or a, a new rifle, a new barrel or whatever, I'll always bed it in. So I'll take one shot with it, not not bothering what it's doing at the target, but just take one shot with it, clean it. Take a couple of shots with it, clean it. Take three or four shots with it and clean it, and just do that um, for the first 50 or 60 shots. So as the rifle the rifle gets bedded to being shot from clean. And so then what you do is, is I'll only shoot a maximum, if I can, if I can help it, if, obviously if we're doing park culling or something like that, when you might be shooting 15 or 16 animals um, in a very short period of time, you might have to stretch it. But ideally, I always try and shoot um, or only, only put through, you know, maximum 10 rounds through a rifle before I clean it and then start again. So then we put a, a fouling round back through it, so just to reset the barrel and uh, make sure that it's bedded in again and then from there we should be uh, set and back on the target. For the dog training Roy takes us to a cornfield near his home. He's got some kit from Dogtra which he wants to play with. What we've got here are um, Dogtra pointing collars. Now they are an e-collar but they're not just an e-collar they've got all sorts of different bits on them they actually let out an audible beep um, for location so if the dog's working in thick cover or if we're working on the mountain and we're in inclement weather and we can't find the dog then we can press the button and it will actually let out a huge um, loud beep so we can we can find out where the dog is so a lot of the times if a dog is on staunch point um, as I say in, in thick woodland or out on the mountains where we can lose them behind rocks or whatever else then with the, the, the dog tra collar here by pressing the, um, the locate button. I'll show you, hang on. Green, let's just turn it on. Right, 
So by pressing the uh, locate button on the dog collar, if the dog is anywhere that we can't find it and we're, we're, we're desperately looking for it, we press the button and it lets out a, a very, a very uh, audible beep so then we can find out where the dog is. He thinks the electric collar is a useful tool despite its unpopularity and even though it is now illegal in Wales. I find it a terrible shame um, if people are going against them because as a training aid um, they are they are superb and also for the, for the dog's safety as well because with some dogs they can be very headstrong and if you're working a field and the hair gets up some dogs are very difficult to stop and they'll chase it and if you've got no way of controlling the dog and bringing it back or stopping the chase then it could easily run into it run over a road and get run over it could run over railway lines um, it could get lost so there's an awful lot going for an electric collar um, um, a lot of people say that if you train your dogs properly then you don't need to use an electric collar but in certain circumstances uh, that if a dog chases and it doesn't matter how much training you've done if that dog just has a momentary lapse and starts running off then it, it just gives you a little bit of a backup so you can keep control of the dog if something does go wrong. With the dogs wired up we get to see the pigeon hypnosis. Less look into my eyes more look under your wing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to dizzy the pigeons up, put three or four out on the field and then we're going to work the pointers into them. Hopefully they'll be, they'll be alright with this, uh, this wind gusting the way it is. Um, and then the dogs will work into them. What we do as soon as they're on point we go round, we head the point off, come into the pigeon as if it was a game bird and then we go in to do the flush. So what I'll do is I'll just show you what we do. We just take said pigeon, tuck his head under his wing there's all sorts of different ways of, of dizzying pigeons. This is just a, a very quick, simple way. And then all you do is you take said pigeon and you put it on the ground with his head under his wing. And then what we do when the dogs come on point, all we do is we roll the pigeon over and remove his head from under his wing. He wakes up, let him get his bearings a little bit and then go in for flushing. Before Cooney gets her run, Ian wants to do some training with his young cocker, Ebony. First, he wants her to retrieve a rabbit and stop on command. She's showing real promise. Now it's time to test if she'll keep calm after flushing a bird. Time to bring out the ejector sling. What we've got here, as I say, is a pigeon release mechanism. And it doesn't hurt the pigeon whatsoever. So the pigeon just goes in to the harness in here. You can get pheasant sized ones, you can get partridge sized ones and what have you as well. This is a partridge sized one. So as I say, pigeon goes in there and then what we do is we just bring the release bar up over the top. Where is it there? It's there. We bring the release bar up over the top there and then it's ready to go. Ian starts at the top of the field and works down. She again does well and when Roy deploys the bird she stays put. Here's a second go in slow-mo. Time to dizzy the white pigeons and hide them in the crop. Just wipe his scent around a little bit. So he's down there up against the cover. We've seen Cooney used before as a deer hound. She needs to multitask and this is ideal training during the off season. The wind is strong and swirling. She seems to pick up and then lose the scent. Roy brings out the more experienced Atos, who helps show her the way. Yeah, what we were doing there, um, as I say, where we were struggling with the wind, um, Cooney, as I say, is quite inexperienced and she's quite hyped up as well. She's just coming into season. So, a lot of the, with, the, with most of the points that we had, um, then they, they had a little bit of scent and working it in, but they were getting very close so that in the end they were sight pointing. Um, and when they were sight pointing, I was just getting the pigeons or, you know, with the, with the pigeons waking up and then just move the pigeons forward. And then it's just, again, just re, uh, reinforcing the control of the dog, making sure that you've got control when the pigeons walking forward and they're, they're not going forward and flushing until you ask them to. But actually what I was doing there was going in and I was flushing the pigeon myself or going up and picking the pigeon up myself. And it just takes the dogs out of the equation. They realize that I'm in charge and uh, they've got to wait until they're, they're asked um, to do whichever uh, task I want them to do. With the dog work done, Roy sends Ian out with a target to ensure the rifle is zeroed. There we go. So they're about an inch high, a hundred, which is about spot on. That's what I want. 
all is well, and we're ready for some foxing, but not before heading back to the house for a cuppa. But look who's back before us. And there's another visitor too. Don's got a box of goodies for Roy to test. So uh, we've got a bundle of new kit that's turned up uh, in the office and um, we wanted to take it out and test it. So Roy's taken over the uh, foxing pages on the magazine. He's our fox shooting expert. So we've got a few devices in here um, which are targeted at the fox shooting market. Um, and rather than just write up a press release, we like to get the, uh, the products out in the field, being evaluated by people that actually know what they're talking about. Um, so yes, yeah, so we're going to give some stuff to Roy, and he's going to try it out later today, hopefully. Ooh. With the kettle on, the guys have Hello, a look through the toys. Bear, crow, this looks like some kind of creature in distress. Wiggles about, and yeah. then it's away we go. It's got a tail. Um, oh, that needs a... That's open, is it? Don't need a shave, Roy. <laughs> Dom leaves us to it, and we head off after those foxes. We get togged up, and Ian is carrying a second camera, so we don't miss that elusive daytime fox shot. Roy has both shotgun and rifle with him. The first farm doesn't deliver, and we move on. We're not messing about. Between the sunshine and the showers, we want to make the most of the day. Farm number two gives us fox number one. From behind a plough he appears and Roy wastes no time. We return to the dog training field as we'd spotted one earlier, but again no joy. Time for a field Roy has been watching for a while, but he has only just got permission to shoot foxes on it. There has been a vixen and he thinks he spots her on the bank. We crawl to get a clear view. Roy calls her in. Another clean kill, and to his surprise, it's yet another dog fox. We've had three dog foxes in this field in the last week and a half, and I was sure that was going to be a vixen out, to, out hunting at the moment, but it's another dog fox. So uh, just goes to show how many there are about. That's a shame, we'll have to carry on for the vixen now. Roy has saved the best location until last. Lying on top of an old quarry, we get a fantastic view. We spot one under one of the large bushes, but it disappears before Roy can get a clean shot. Then another darts from below the cliff we're lying on. Roy squeaks it, but it accelerates to the far edge of the quarry. He stops, and Roy takes a 220-yard shot. And it looks great from way above the quarry, on top of the quarry. We decide to fire up the new electronic call to see if we can entice the other fox out. We see movement, and after a few minutes, out pops fox number two and number four of the evening. Again, another great shot made all the more impressive by the location. All it needs now is for obedient Ian to descend to the cliff face and retrieve the foxes. The first one came out underneath us on the bottom of this bank here, um, but he'd unfortunately that one had centred us where we're on the top. He'd obviously come round behind us and our wind's blowing right down there, so he, he centred us and then took off like a scalded cat across the, uh, the opening of the, the quarry here um, and just stopped over in the distance there. He was just on 220. Um, luckily, I, I got a shot off on him, so he was down. Carried on squeaking, um, and it's amazing, even after a shot has gone off um, and echoing all the way around the quarry, you would have thought it would be finished, but then the other vix or the, the, uh, the other fox, I'm not sure if it was a vixen or a dog, came trotting out from behind the bushes, and it was very, very cautious, slowly working its way around uh, behind the bushes here. Wasn't quite sure if it wanted to come in or not, um, and then just showed itself at the top there, and uh, we got her as well. So four foxes in one evening, well, I think we'll call it quits on that.